We've got a great group here. Hi, Ellie. I just saw you popped on my screen. Listen, Bill, I met Bill in California about the same time I met you, Ellie Walsh. Um, uh, Bill is class of 1978. And, um, and he went to Bryant at a time when um, we know that campus was developing. He worked in wine and wine stores, local wine stores while he was a student at Bryant. He graduated in 1978 with a degree in marketing. And he worked around uh, in Connecticut for a bit, but moved to Napa, California in 1981. Uh, he 82. Then went, yeah, 82. 82. Okay, all right. Um, he went back to the University of California, Davis, to study enology and viticulture. And since that time on, he has been in the wine business in many, re in many respects, mostly as a national sales manager for uh, initially um, for uh, Farniente or Tarnieras Creek. And when I met you, you were at Steel Winery for a long time. Now right. it's a really neat place. We've got some great pictures of it. Um, we're going to find, I've never been, I've been to Napa, but I haven't been to the castle. Um, but we're going to talk about the Castillo de Amorosa Winery. Um, hopefully you're going to taste the three wines. If you didn't buy them, you can get them after the tasting direct from Bill at a great discount. Um, I bought two cases. Um, of different wines because the shipping on a case was just like a steal. So, um, so Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. He's um, he's a good friend of Bryant. Um, he's been really, really, really fun to work with. And we're he's going to introduce us to these three wines. And um, he lives in California with his wife Doreen, who helped set him up, and his daughters and granddaughter. And um, I can see um, why you love it out there. So, Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Robin. It's a, it's a treat to be part of this today. It's a real honor to be back working with Bryant as such after having gone to school there 40 some odd years ago now and to be able to come back and uh, share my uh, background and a little bit about the wines we have here today is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you again. Uh, yeah, my, I started in the wine career when I was at Bryant. Uh, summer job in 1975 and 76 down in Connecticut. I grew up in Southbury, Connecticut. And uh, when I went back to school in fall of of uh, 77 for my junior year, or actually fall of 76 for my juniors. I, uh, I worked at Town Wine and Spirits, Town Liquor over in Rumford, uh, Rhode Island, Little East Providence. And that's where you know, I really got bitten by the wine bug. And uh, all of a sudden uh, my avocation became my vocation. And uh, it, was, it was a treat. I mean, I can remember when I graduated from Bryant in 1978, my dad had just died about a year or so earlier, and he was the one that really kind of got me into wine initially. But we went out, I took my mom out to dinner at a restaurant over in Greenville. I can't remember the name of it, but I could tell you the wine that we drank. We had a 1966 Joseph Drouin uh, Bon Clos de Mouche, a 12-year-old Pinot Noir Burgundy that was stunning. So I could tell you the wine I drank at my graduation, but that's about it at this point. Besides, so uh, it's a treat to be here today. Uh, as Rob was saying, yeah, I, I, when I moved to California, I, I moved out here basically to go to the University of California, Davis, and study winemaking with the hopes of either getting a degree in winemaking or find a job in Napa Valley. And I got halfway through the degree in Napa in, at Davis. I wasn't in grad school because I hadn't studied chemistry since high school. So uh, I was asked to, uh, they, they took my application and, and allowed me to go to undergraduate school for a couple of years, but I was learning cookbook chemistry without getting my hands dirty. So I uh, moved over to Napa Valley uh, during Labor Day week in 1982, and it was the first harvest at a winery called Farniente Winery, which some of you may have heard of. And uh, I uh, was lucky enough to get a job there for three months, and I lived at the winery for the, during that period. And it was really a very, very special time. It was the first harvest there. We're doing Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay, and that was it. Uh, then I was going back to Davis, and another friend of mine who had just graduated from, from Davis with his master's degree in enology, enology being the science of winemaking, he uh, asked me if I was interested in taking a job at another winery, Carneros Creek Winery. And I said, I'll take it for one year and just get a full year production cycle. And then I'll uh, go back to Davis and finish my degree. Well, I ended up staying at, at, at uh, Canaris Creek Winery for 19 years and never went back to Davis. Then in 2001, by the first five years, I worked production. I was in uh, winemaking, uh, barrel blending, bottling, the whole bit from crushing grapes right to bottling, the whole bit. I worked in various aspects, not as much lab work, but uh, more cellar work. But uh, by five years into it, my marketing background from Bryant kicked in and I have a gift for gab from time to time, people say. So I, uh, I uh, started doing sales and marketing for 
Canaris Creek Winery. And by the time I left, I was vice president of sales and national sales manager. And I was doing international sales in Japan, uh, all across Northern Europe, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, uh, France, a little bit, not much in France, mostly in England, Ireland. And uh, then in 2001, Canaris Creek was sold and uh, the new owner wanted to bring his own team in. So I was, uh, I was put out to pasture. I was deemed redundant, as I say. And I ran into another industry friend of mine, Jed Steele, up in Lake County. Uh, Jed Steele is best known as being the founding winemaker for Kendall Jackson Winery. And he was there from 1983 up until 1991 when he started his own winery. And uh, in 2001, I was asked to become his national sales manager. He had never had a national sales manager in the past. He had had a couple part-time people doing sales, but uh, I was asked to do the sales position for steel. And it was about a 75,000 case winery. We were doing very little export wine. I was doing a little bit in Canada, but uh, none, none outside of the U.S. Well, this past August during COVID, Jed Steele, now 76 years old, decided to retire. And uh, he sold his winery and the new owners had their own team. So uh, again, I was uh, put out to pasture looking for another position. And this opportunity came along at uh, Amorosa, Castello de Amorosa Winery up in Calistoga. And I've known Dario Satui, we had met socially over the years. And ironically, he worked at Canaris Creek Winery 10 years before I did. So that's kind of a, a nice come around as such to come work for Dario. And I'm now working in a, a sales team called Outbound Sales. And Outbound Sales is uh, we follow up the sales of customers who have been to the winery and look for repeat sales and build relationships with those customers. Dario's business model is really interesting in such that you can only buy the wines directly at the winery. There's no wholesale sales. There's no retail sales around the country. So you have to... Uh, buy the wines directly at the castle up in Calistoga, up in the northern end of Napa Valley. So uh, it's it, by cutting out the two levels of middlemen makes our wine prices very competitively priced, well-priced and good values vis-a-vis -vis other wineries in Napa and Sonoma. So uh, what I chose today was to pick out three wines. Uh, a little more background on the castle. We're gonna do, first of all, we do Pinot Blanc, then our Gioia Rosé, Rosato de Sangiovese, and then finish up with our Sangiovese Red. But uh, more background on the castle, Dario had a winery that he started in an homage to his great grandfather named Vittorio Satui. So he has V Satui Winery and St. Helena Winery in Napa. And then uh, we have some of the pictures showing up here. Then in, in uh, 1991, he bought 170 acres up in the north, western corner of Napa Valley uh, near Calistoga. And he, he, he's a real nature preserve lover. So he's dedicated 100 acres into nature preserve. We planted 30 acres of Cabernet Sauvignon up in around the winery property and started building this castle that's showing the pictures here. Dario, he had family over in Italy and he purchased the castle over in Italy uh, years ago. So he started buying dilapidated rock from castles that were falling apart, took, took the castle, took 175 containers of stone over from Europe to Napa Valley and recreated uh, a castle as you would have seen in the 13th century. There's four stories underground with the wine cellar aging area, retail sales area, but below that we have a dungeon, we have a torture chamber. But on the main levels, we have the great hall that's being shown right now and a big center courtyard, and then three levels above going up to the towers to such. So it's a 137,000 square foot building with 107 rooms, it's just massive. And uh, being that you can only buy the wines at the castle, it has become quite a destination uh, for visitors to come to Napa Valley and visit the castle from all over the world. On a weekend, a pre-COVID weekend day, we would get 2,500 people coming through the castle. And now it's about half of that. But as the COVID uh, becomes more under control, uh, we'll start to see the numbers pop up again. Last weekend, I was up there working on Saturday at the castle. I do help out with tastings and tours at the castle also. And we had 1,300 people there through that on last Saturday. So really, really uh, amazing uh, operation as such. So going through the three wines today that we're gonna have, the first wine is our Pinot Bianco. Pinot Bianco is also known as Pinot Blanc. Uh, you see it grown in France, in the Burgundy region of France, a little bit up in Alsace, 
in northeastern France, but you'll see it in the northern part of Italy also, and there, where it's known as Pinot Bianco, more the Italian translation of Pinot Blanc that you would know uh, from France as such. And uh, what we're tasting here is kind of green apple, Granny Smith, a real clean, crisp fruit. There's no oak to this wine at all. It's just really refreshing. Quite fresh, quite fresh. So uh, yeah, get kind of that green apple Granny Smith tone. It's right around threshold level of sugar. Uh, uh, most people taste sugar right about one half of 1% or 0 0.5 grams per milliliter. And it's uh, this is right around that level. So you get a, just a touch of fruit in the background, but it's clean, crisp, dry finish to it. It's not sweet at all. And uh, perfect complement with, uh, you know, salmon or grilled chicken. My wife Doreen makes a really killer uh, sole dish, petroli sole. Uh, we will do that. And uh, it's really you know, perfect with that. Our chicken dishes works real well also. Real clean, crisp, easy drinking style uh, white wine. Besides uh, Pinot Grigio, uh, Pinot, excuse me, Pinot Bianco, we do make a Pinot Grigio, we make a Vermentino, and we make a Chardonnay and Gewürztraminer for other uh, dry white wines. Then we make two dessert style white wines, we make a late harvest Gewürztraminer, which is about 10% residual sugar. And then we also make a wine called Il Pasito, which is more like a French Sauterne. It's a blend of Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. And again, about 10% residual sugar, quite sweet, quite rich, perfect dessert style wine and such. So uh, those are the, the whites that we make at the winery and uh, just really refreshing and, and clean and crisp. People enjoying the wine so far? I, I don't see comments popping up, but it's all right. I'm sure you're all enjoying the wines. I'm not sure if you can see some of those videos, but a lot of people are cheering to you, Bill. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Cheers to everybody. I see little pictures up there in the corner, and it's fun to meet some of the people that I've been speaking to, like Rita and Orville and Leanne and Tara. Uh, and where's Sam? I saw Sam up there. He didn't have his picture up, but Sam Broomer, uh, it's a treat. You know, it's funny, having grown up in Connecticut, I, I was grew up in Western Connecticut, the Berkshires, and uh, then I went to Bryant, and then after that, I moved to California. So it's always fun to meet some people from my old neighborhoods of, uh, Cal of Connecticut. And I spent a lot of time in northern Maine, also with some property up there. So uh, uh, anybody from Maine, I'm more than glad to say hi to you anytime. It's a, it's a real treat to be from up there. So any uh, comments or questions about the, uh, uh, hey, Rita, see it. Thanks, Rita. Uh, yeah, any questions about the white wines anybody has or uh, just like light, fresh, easy drinking. Uh, for the people that did not buy the wines, that wine normally sells for uh, $29 a bottle, but I had it and I can get it to you guys for $24.50 a bottle. It's a you know, great, great value. Those and, and our prices that I'm offering you are better than you'll find anywhere on our website. Now, I can always match our website prices if we have any, any specials going on, but more often than not, I do have some deeper deals on these wines. So uh, enjoy the, enjoy the uh, Pinot Bianco. It's very, very nice wine. The second wine that we're going to taste is our Gioia Rosé, Rosato de Sangiovese. Rosato is just an Italian term for rosé. Sangiovese is a great variety, which is best known for making uh, Chianti uh, in northern Italy. Makes a you know, nice, fresh, full-bodied, medium full-bodied uh, red. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it, with the rosé, uh, a Rosato de Sangiovese under the, uh, under the Gioia label. What we're doing here during fermentation process, we'll crush the grapes and the juice of red, most red grapes, and especially with Sangiovese or Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon, the juice inside the berries of the, of the fruit is clear. It's a white juice as such. And the color extraction comes out when the skins are broken up and the skins are soaking inside this clear juice. And if you leave the, the skins on the on the juice for five days, seven days, 10 days, you'll make a full bodied red wine out of it. But if you take the juice off the skins at anywhere from 12 hours to 24 hours, and this is about 12 to 14 hours skin contact, um, and then drain the juice out, you'll get this lovely pink kind of hues to it as such. And uh, you know, more and more people are getting into rose days these days. We do make a Pinot Noir rose, but my favorite is the Sangiovese rose, both because of that light, fresh, easy drinking style. And then I have to ha put a plug in it. The name of uh, the name of the wine is called Joya, 
and Joy by Chance is the name of my eldest daughter. Same spelling, G-I-O-I-A. My father's uh, first child, my oldest half-sister, was named Joya. And when uh, my daughter was born, we asked my sister if we could use her name and honor her by using it. So it's kind of cool to work at a winery that has a name, a wine named after my daughter, who's a family name as such. So uh, I think uh, in, in when tasting wine, for some of you who have not been made, you know, uh, serious wine tasters in the past, what you're looking for, hold the glass of the wine by the stem. If you hold it by the glass itself, you can get fingerprints on there, and you, if you cup it, you're going to warm the you're going to warm the wine up. If you hold it by the stem, uh, it makes it easier to twirl. When you're twirling the wine, what you're trying to do there is get some air, oxygen inside the wine, it's inside the wine that's in the glass, and it allows the wine to volatize its esters to bring out the aroma components in the wine. So by swirling it, what you're going to do is get, get some aromas coming out. In this case, I kind of get a watermelon, kind of watermelon rind kind of uh, aromas coming through, uh, and then a little bit of uh, strawberry kind of notes to it. And what you're looking for is continuity from aromas to the fruit flavors that you get in your mouth. You want good acidity so it's bright and fresh and fruity. If it has too low acidity, they can be kind of flabby and cloying. Um, and it'll kind of, the, the sweetness will really kind of come through. Uh, you're looking for good you know, fruit flavors and such. And then when you swallow the wine, you want to see those flavors kind of linger down your throat. And uh, so when you're tasting it, Kind of move your tongue around a little bit and swirl the wine so all parts of your mouth get in contact with the wine. And that being uh, what's happening there, the tip of your tongue is where you get acidity, you get tannins in the back of your throat. If you rub your tongue across the roof of your mouth, you get a kind of a drying sensation on the roof of your mouth. That comes from tannins also. The tannins from your cheeks come from oak barrel tannins, which just doesn't have any. Um, the tannins on the roof of your mouth is more from the skins of the grapes as such. So very, very nicely well-balanced wine as such. Easy drinking, again, with chicken, pork chops, uh, ham would be a good dish for this. Burgers on the grills, hamburgers, hot dogs, what have you, uh, will, will work out real fine with this wine also. Uh, light, easy drinking. We do make another uh, rosé called uh, uh, our Crestadoro, uh, Rosato de Crestadoro. Crestadoro is a vineyard over in Sonoma County that we have Pinot Noir grapes over in uh, Russian River area of Sonoma County, uh, western, central western Sonoma. And uh, that, that Pinot Noir is uh, a little bit lighter than this, but just a kind of a creamy softness to it. But I like the freshness of the uh, uh, rosé, the Rosato of Sangiovese, the Joya wine here. So Robin said that she really likes this rosé. Um, her question is, how does it compare to your rosé um, of Pinot Noir? The Pinot Noir is going to be a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter in color, uh, a little softer. It's not, I think there's more acidity in the Sangiovese rosé. The Pinot Noir rosé is a little softer, a little more mellow in style as such. Um, but both lovely wines. I, 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 like the, I like the body and the richness that you get from the Sangiovese Rosé. Pinot Noir Rosé is more like a white wine with just a little blush of pink color to it. So, and I encourage you all to come out to Napa sometime and visit me here at our house. Right, the view that we have right now in the background, this is, I live down in the Carneros region, the southern part of Napa Valley. Uh, I'm about five, maybe seven miles south of the town of Napa and maybe 10 to 15 miles uh, south west uh, southeast of the town of Sonoma. The water that you see behind me is the Napa River. We're about five miles off of the San Francisco Bay. This, the northern end of the San Francisco Bay is called the San Pablo Bay. And we get the breezes kicking up. That's why my hair is kind of fluffing around here. Uh, so we're we're right on the Napa River. So my deck overlooks the Napa River. It's about a, a 30 minute drive up to the castle for me here, which isn't an issue. I don't mind going up, but uh, it's always a treat to just entertain people on our back deck. We have, we have a quite a substantial wine cellar. My wife and I have been collecting wines. I still have a couple bottles of wine that I bought when I worked at Town Liquor in Rhode Island in 1977 while I was a student at Bryant. 1971 Freemark Gabby Petit Syrah and 1971 Ridge Vineyard York Creek Vineyard Petit Syrah. Wines made from both the same vineyard, different winemakers from the same year and I'm just waiting to find the right people. So anybody born in 1971 and wants to come out and celebrate their 50th birthday, I'll pop the bottles for you. Let's do it. So uh, you never know, I, I, I'm game, you just gotta show up. So, you know what, uh, if you're interested, we may have to do an alumni trip. 
yeah, alumni trip out to the West Coast, or when you're doing the next time you're doing a San Francisco event, uh, be more than glad to help entertain and uh, do a little barbecuing on the back deck. And we get uh, uh, Noreen to come have Noreen come out. You do the charcuterie for us in advance. Although my do- my wife is learning, she learned it all inside. She was watching the, you know, on the computer inside while I'm sitting out here uh, tasting the wines and such. So enjoying the uh, rosé, good stuff. Lots of thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up. Perfect. So the yeah. third one. Yep. Question. Did you see Eliza is on? Yeah, our daughter. Liz, I say Liz. My daughter Liz is on here. She lives in Boston. I got to give Liz a shout out because she uh, ended up getting a degree in chemical engineering. She didn't consider going to Bryant at all because there's no engineering program at Bryant. But she got a degree in chemical engineering at Northeastern University up in Boston. Graduated in 2016, and for the past five years has been working for a company called Ambry uh, Batteries, and she works on the seals of these new. Uh, infrastructure battery systems and just got her first patent so we're very proud of lizzie getting her first patent so that's pretty sweet so very cool and thanks liz for joining and i i know she has a couple of the bottles up there she's tasting wines with us and we miss you liz love you hope to see you out in napa sometime sooner than later i know you're coming out i'm also on with myla who has bought wine from you (laughs) right hey myla how you doing it's good to hear from you guys cool so uh before we move to the red, Bill, do you, shall we do our, our, our poll question, Jess? What do you think? Yeah, let's do the poll question. Get that in and, uh, you know, throw that in. Yeah, That'd be great. I, I, yeah. I, I did have a question, too. We just opened our red, just so we know. How yep. should we have opened that? How long ago should we have opened that? Well, that's, that's a great question. I think with white wines and rosés, you could just open them and pop them and they'll be they'll be nice within five or 10 minutes. Red wines, if they're, especially if they're younger and fuller bodied red wines, and I say Sangiovese is a mid range for the scale of lighter red wines to fuller bodied red wines. You go lighter red wines with Pinot Noir and maybe Gamay and sometimes Zinfandel. It really depends on the style. But Sangiovese is in the middle range as far as richness. Then you go into fuller bodied red wines like Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Verdot, Zinfandel, Malbec uh, are all fuller bodied wines, Syrah and Petit Syrah. But th- this wine here, I would give it 15, 20 minutes of, of you know, open it up, pull off a glass of wine so you're just getting more air contact inside the bottle. 10 or 15 minutes is all you really need. Uh, if it's a really big full bodied Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, I brought also which we're not tasting today, but I might pop it and taste it with anybody who wants to sit and listen, watch me slurp over this. This is called our La Castellana. This is uh, 65% Cabernet Sauvignon, 16% Merlot, 15% Sangiovese, 2% Malbec, and 2% Petit Verdot. And this wine really needs probably a half hour of aging. So what I'm gonna do is while we're talking here, I'm gonna pop this bottle so I can taste it later and I can talk about it uh, and instruct you guys about this this really cool bottle of wine. This is called a Super Tuscan. Super Tuscans are reds that are made uh, in Tuscany where they make Chianti. Originally, the only grape that you could grow in Tuscany for red wines was Sangiovese. But as time went on, the growers realized that Cabernet Sauvignon does very, very well in the Tuscany and Umbria region of, of northern Italy. So you started seeing winers like Antonori uh, and Sessacaia do these blends of Cabernet Sauvignon and, and Sangiovese, maybe a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Petit Verdot. And uh, so this, this wine that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna pop and taste a little bit later, uh, the La Castellana is, uh, is an homage to that style of wine made over in Italy as such. So, uh, and I, I just popped this now, but it would really benefit for another half hour in the, uh, you know, you know, allowing it to breathe. Yeah. So. As we allow this to breathe, I'm going to show that um, the, the results to the poll. So we had yeah. two questions. Um, you should be able to see some of the answers right now. The first question, have you been to Napa Valley before? And we had over about 80% of the um, uh, participants answer. 48 said yes. 48% said yes. And 52% said no, they have not been to Napa Valley before. Well, and go ahead. For, yeah. for the second one, um, have you been to the castle? We have Three participants that said, yes, they have. So that makes up about 14%. Yay. And 18 um, of our guests said, no, they have not been. 
Well, I encourage you to come out to visit the castle and, and Napa Valley in general. If anybody wants to come out to Napa Valley and you know get in touch with me directly, uh, you'll have my phone number and email address later that's going to be shown in the uh, PowerPoint. But I'm more than glad to uh, show you around our wine or the castle. But if anybody needs ideas on hotels to stay at, restaurants to make reservations at, other wineries to visit that are owned by friends of mine, having lived in Napa Valley for the past 38 years now, I've run across most people, the names that you would know, like Robert Mondavi was a, uh, I was lucky enough to dine at his house a couple times. Uh, Louis Martini Winery, Louis uh, was an old personal friend. His son, Mike, is more my age and uh, a really, really good friend of mine. Um, a lot of these other wineries, the people at Farniente that I worked with, you don't burn bridges in this business. You kind of stay in touch with everybody. And it's an agricultural business. So everybody's helping each other out. You know, sometimes you have a pump breakdown you call up one of your neighbor wineries, hey, do you an extra pump I can borrow because I'm, I need to do some pump overs and I'm getting ready to bottle. Uh, there, it's really a fraternal sense because each bottle of wine is a piece of art. It's a statement of, of chemistry and physics and thermodynamics, but you have the winemaker who has the ability to create his personality within the, within the blends of the wines. And I think the sign of a true great winemaker is that his style of winemaking is consistent year in and year out, that there is a personal house style to the wine. You look at a winery like Chateau Latour in Bordeaux or Chateau Margaux, uh, over you know, hundreds of years, Latour is big, rich, bold, uh, and where Chateau Margaux is a little bit softer, but that's because Poyac is a little bit further north, a little bit cooler area along the Giron River, where Margaux is a little bit further south and a little bit warmer. So, but the, there's very consistency of how style. And I think our winemaker, Brooks Painter, has been with us for since we started the winery. He's been with us. Uh, we opened the winery in 2007. It took 15 years. We started building the castle back in, two, in 1993. And it took 15 years to construct this castle. Uh, so uh, and Brooks came on board as our winemaker back in 2007, 2008. So he's been with us for you know, uh, almost 15 years now as such. And so the real consistent house style, we, while we, the wines are only sold at the winery, we do send them out for press to the likes of the Wine Spectator magazine, or Robert Parker's Wine Advocate, or various other magazines, uh, wine enthusiasts, things like that. Uh, this, La Castellana that I just pulled out, that's a hundred dollar bottle of wine that got, uh, you know, 94 points, you know, so it's a, it's a serious bottle of wine and the other wines get 90, 92, 93 points quite regularly. So it's, uh, it's pretty consistent across the board for uh, the, the quality of the bottles and such. So, um, so hopefully that gives you a little insight onto the wines and such. Uh, the, as I say, the last wine, the Sangiovese, we own vineyards in, Calistoga area, the Diamond Mountain area where the, the winery is located. We also have vineyards down in the Coombsville area, which is down south and east of the city of Napa. And then we have uh, a Carneros Pinot Noir vineyard also. The Sangiovese vineyard are a couple local growers. We have long-term contracts with independent farmers that grow our grapes, grow probably half to three quarters of our grapes are long-term contracts with the like of Melanson Vineyards up in Pritchard Hill, which is where Chapelet Winery is and Bryant Family and Tim Mondavi's Continuum Wineries up there. And then we have uh, uh, Don Thomas Vineyards and uh, more solely Borges Vineyards, which are both in Rutherford. Rutherford is the central part of Napa Valley going north to south. And it's on the west side of the valley uh, they're called Rutherford Dust because you get this nice kind of dusty soft tannin to it uh, versus the, the Atlas, the, uh, the um, Diamond Mountain Cabernets that we have up on by the winery and up on Pritchard Hill or more structured, more intense uh, Cabernet. So it's nice to have these different styles as such. But the uh, Sangiovese comes from a couple different growers in the central part of Napa Valley. Again, nice rich color to it. Uh, you see that dark purple hue. Again, by swirling it, you're going to bring out the esters, bring out the, uh, the intensity of, of aromas and flavors. I get Bing cherry, black cherry kind of flavors, a little earthy kind of tarry aroma note, not not asphalt, but just just a just a little richness to it, almost a clove like cinnamon tones. So as we're tasting um, the reds, uh, we have a question from Kathleen to the group. So if we were to put together a group of twenty or so alumni for a select food and wine tour, what time of year would you suggest? Uh, that's that's a great question. Uh, there's there's 
uh, several points I would look at that. First of all, um, I like to have people come out uh, obviously, during harvest is is really fun and dynamic. Harvest being September and October, uh, but it's really really busy at that time of the year. So it's hard to get the attention of the winemaker to sit down with you because he's busy harvesting grapes and making wine. Uh, but that being said, we we do have a staff. I could easily put together an event up at the castle for a group of Brian alums sometime. Uh, let's 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 talk about down the line, uh, Robin, when we have a chance uh, to do a Brian event up at the castle and do a sit down tasting for as many alums that would like to learn about the castle get the full board tour the other time of year that i think is really uh, best for a lot of people especially if you're from new england is come out in late february or early march uh, or all throughout march as such because you're tired of snow and slush on the east coast at that point and and by march february and march we're 70 degrees 65 to 70 degrees the vines are just starting to open up uh the shoots are just starting to pop out wild mustard everywhere in the vineyards it's very very pretty we get all of our rain in the winter time it stops it starts raining sometime in late october early November and we'll have rain on and off through February into March but by February March is less less predictable rain as such and uh, it's a very very pretty time to come out so again my favorite times is March because you're tired of snow and slush you want to get out of the winter come out to California and boom it's it's peak spring season right now so uh, and here we are in may we haven't had any rain here in the past month or so the hills start drying out it gets a little dusty summertime's summertime's a nice time to come out also and so it's any time year round but my favorite time is either harvest or in the early spring as such to, just because uh, uh the fact that you're tired of snow and slush back east and uh and come out and nap and enjoy uh, what spring's gonna be like in another couple of weeks or another month or so back east I think March is winning. Yeah, yeah. Bill, I think well, a March well, a March well, trip would be killer. Yeah, Bill, we've got, it looks like we've got, we've got some groups that aren't ready to travel um, and right away. We've got others who are ready to be there uh, in March. It's a good thing you said spring because your wife said spring, so. There you are, there you are. <laughs> so she's sitting well. inside on her own computer. So <laughs> she, she's, she's remotely so she, uh, connected yeah, to us yeah. here. So, but spring so is. Kathleen Brown wants to plan a trip um, uh, for the alumni in March of 2022, and I think we've got some people interested. Um, Jim and I were, uh, Jim McGee and, and Meg and I were exchanging notes, and we're not quite ready in 2022, but um, yeah, because right, as William, as Rita says, we're going to be in Southeast Asia next spring, so, oh, nice, so but nice. we're, we're all ready to start traveling, and um, I think it would be fun to go to California. Ellie, you'd come back with us, right? So, yeah. so absolutely, absolutely. So I really like this red. Talk, talk to us about that. This again a little bit more because it's really sure. Wait, right, but and and Bill, before you and in addition to yep. that, look at uh, Marissa has a question oh, yes. particularly about the dryness factor. How how do you know when you're tasting any red and this red in particular, where is it on that dry scale? What what does that mean if you're kind of new to the tasting? Sure, sure. That's a great question because there are most red wines are dry with the exception of like port, port style wines. And that's because you stop the fermentation early to get about three or four percent residual sugar. And then you'll add brandy back to get up to about 20 percent alcohol and uh, makes a, a very intense dessert style red wine uh, or late harvest Zinfandel. If they leave the grapes on the vine for uh, you know, an extra couple of weeks or a month, the sugars raise from about 25% sugar up to about 35 or 40% sugar. And yeast will only convert sugar to alcohol up to about 16, 17%. So you might have about four or five or 10% residual sugar. But most red wines such as Pinot Noir, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sangiovese, Malbec, uh, Zinfandel, the bulk of those are all dry red wines. I think you'll find the perception of a little sweetness more so in Pinot Noir because the skins are thinner on Pinot Noir. And the, so it really accelerates the bright, fresh fruit flavor. It may be dry, but it'll have that lingering strawberry, strawberry jam kind of tones to it. Where the Sangiovese here, this is dry. There's no residual sugar in this at all. Most Cabernet Sauvignons have no residual sugar. Most Merlots. Again, real dry, clean, crisp, but you still have that fresh fruit flavors in the mid part of the palate as such. So uh, uh, it, this going back to this wine particularly, the color I think is brilliant. You know, that dark ruby red color as such. 
aromas, black cherry, that Bing kind of cherry, a little clove kind of tone, spice in the background. Nice acidity, a tingling sensation on the tip of your tongue. There's some tannins on the on your cheeks that are coming. This was aged 18 months in French oak barrels. So you get a little bit of drying sensation in your cheeks on the sides of your tongue. But as you rub your tongue across the roof of your mouth, you get more drying sensation there. And that comes out of the tannins from the skin of the grapes. So what you're looking for is just a, a round, harmonious feel across your palate for these uh, you know, different flavor components to interact with each other. And another thing to talk about red wines, red wines will age very gracefully, especially fuller bodied red wines like Sangiovese or Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir to a certain degree, Zinfandel also will age real nicely. So it's, it's nice to have, right now, the, the Sangiovese we're tasting is 2016 vintage, right at five years, just almost five years old now. Um, the wine is just coming into its own. And I think this wine will hold quite comfortably in a cellar for the next uh, five to 10, 15 years depending on cellar conditions. Talking about cellar conditions, I'm, I'm talking about temperature in your wine cellar, empirically, ideally should be 55 degrees. The only way you're gonna do that is put a, some sort of air conditioning unit, unless you live in a castle in Northern Scotland or in the North somewhere. Um, so 55 degrees with 70% humidity is uh, ideal conditions. But that being said, wines are pretty, pretty resilient. Uh, as long as you can keep them under 65 degrees or 68 degrees for an extended period of time, they'll age just as well, just a little bit quicker. They'll still have that bright, fresh fruit tones to them, but they won't have the longevity as if it had been stored at 55 degrees. Um, humidity, you want the humidity fairly high, about 70% again, because that'll keep the corks moist. If the corks start drying out, they'll shrink. Some oxygen can get into the wine while it's in the bottle and start aging the wine prematurely. And if you have 100% humidity, the wine, the cork will, it will, will soak up. There won't be any issues there, but you get some mold on the labels. You could have labels uh, disintegrate over time. And uh, so ideally again, 55 degrees, 70% humidity would be uh, you know, the perfect place to, uh, to, for temperature wise. And then keep your wines say, uh, age on their side, store them on the side, red wines, or any, or any wine that's in the cork finished bottle, because you want the cork to be in contact with the liquid so it can uh, not shrink. If it's if you stand up a, a red wine that ha that's cork finished and leave it like that for a period of six months or a year, the cork is gonna shrink and allow the air to get in there. Um, a screw cap wine and both the, uh, Joya and the Pinot Bianco, those are both screw caps on those bottles, and you can stand those upright. Uh, they'll, they'll be fine, or storm refrigerators, no big deal. So hopefully that uh, helps on the, uh, the questions to set up there. But getting back to the Sangiovese here, as I say, that light, bright black cherry, Bing cherry with a little clove note. Nice, fresh fruit, medium body. This would be great with, because the Sangiovese has such good acidity, it pairs well with pasta dishes, especially with tomato sauce. Tomatoes have such high acidity that some wines can be overpowered by the acidity in the tomato sauce. But that's why Sangiovese is such a, a great Italian grape, because it has good acidity and will balance out with uh, pasta dishes, uh, lasagna, raviolis, uh, spaghetti with a tomato sauce, marinara sauce will work out quite well. If you use a pasta with uh, a clam sauce, I would go with the Pinot Bianco or with the rosé. But with, uh, with uh, you know, a full bodied uh, Italian red wine dishes, this would be a perfect compliment. Uh, hopefully that gives you a little insight also into, that, into, into how I would serve it. Any other questions popping up here? I see people, people like this one. That's nice. Thanks. Bill, I've got a question. Um, um, we drink, we actually like our reds a little bit on the cold side. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's been growing on us to the point that we refrigerate them like the whites. So, you know, don't tell on me. But, no, no, no. Well, uh, you know, the, you know, every, you know, the, 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 the common thought in, in wine countries that most people serve their white wines too cold and their red wines too warm. Okay. I think white, you, you take your uh, rosé, 
uh, that you have in your refrigerator is going to be 38 degrees. And I, you, you lose a lot of flavor in white wine and rosés if they're, if they're served at 38 degrees. I like white wine and rosé maybe closer to 40 or 45 degrees, where red wines, um, room temperature being 70 degrees, that's a little bit too warm. I like red wines, lighter red wines in the 60 degree range, fuller body red wines, maybe 65 degrees. So wouldn't hurt to put the red wine in a fridge. If it's 70 degrees, put it in for five or 10 minutes. That's not going to hurt it at all. So just a slight chill. It'll bring out the acidity, make the wines really fresh and vibrant in its flavor, flavor wise as such. Okay, good. I feel much better about that then. There you go. <laughs> Trying, the sun's going up, popping over the hill. I'm sort of backing up a little bit, so I'm not halfway in the face here. So uh, people enjoying the, enjoying the uh, San Giovese? All good? Some comments here. Thanks. Yeah. Phil, at the winery, what um, what would you say? Oh, I'm still no, I'm not muted now. What would you say is the is the most popular wine that you've got at the winery? Uh, you know, that's that's a it's a funny question because we have a wine called La Fantasia, the fantasy. It's a it's a frizzante, slightly sparkling, uh, rosé style wine that has about maybe one and a half percent residual sugar. And for consumers that are coming to the castle, that want to come to the castle and visit the castle just for the uniqueness of the castle and the building itself, they may not be regular wine drinkers. And a lot of novice wine drinkers look for a little sweetness to it. That's why German Rieslings are popular. Chenin Blancs are popular. They can be light and fruity. So this bottle called La Fantasia is a very, very popular wine of ours uh, for, you know, because of the sweetness factor. As far as red wines and full-bodied red wines, the La Castellana that I brought out and our, we do make a couple of Pinot Noirs, the Sangiovese, and then our Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon, we have a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. We do single vineyard Cabernet Sauvignons. And then uh, we have a, a wine called Il Barone, which is a, you know, the, for the baron of the castle as such. And that's a very, very popular red wine for us. So Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Zinfandel are probably, and Sangiovese are three most popular red wines. White wines, I'd say Pinot Bianco, uh, Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay. Then we also do a small amount of Vermentino, but not a lot of people know Vermentino is a great variety. We do Gewurz uh, which is also uh, you know known in Austria, in Austria, Germany, and Alsace. Kind of a little spiciness to it, <clears throat> but not that not that common. And you see a little bit down in Italy. So Chardonnay, Pinot Pinot Grigio, Pinot Bianco are our prime uh, white wines uh, volume as such. And with the rosés, I'd say. La Fantasia, followed by the Joya Rosé, and then the uh, Crestadoro Rosato, Pinot Noir Rosé, probably come in a, a slightly third in that sense. Bill? Yep. Um, why is it that the Sangiovese has a cork and the other ah. two are screw caps? Uh, that's another good question. Thank you. Um, well, traditionally, I mean, cork has only been used for wine stoppering for the past 300 years. Prior to that, they would use clay or put olive oil over the top of the wines and amphoras. Um, and uh, so cork it became popular back in the late 1700s throughout the 1800s and the 1900s and 19th, 20th century. And now, um, you know, it's into the 21st century um, because it allows the air to pass through the cork very slowly and get a little of oxygen into the wine and start maturing the wine. Um, screw caps have become popular over the past couple of years. Uh, and there's been screw cap wines with twist off screw caps going back 50 or 50 plus years. And it was always thought to be, oh, it's an inexpensive wine. It's nothing special. Just throw a screw cap on it and it'll just be fine. There's no need to spend the money on a cork. So corks you usually see on red wines or Chardonnays, uh, all our Chardonnays are cork finished, but light fruity white wines like the Pinot Bianco or our Pinot Grigio or Rosés, we just want to put a screw cap on there. So ease of service, the screw cap is airtight, the wine will always stay fresh, um, you know, until you open it up. Then once it's open, you can store it in the refrigerator and it'll last three, four days quite comfortably. But uh, with red wines, just having the cork as a, as a, as a stopper, as a, an enclosure as such, you have a little bit of oxygen passing through, which allows the wine to mature gracefully. Um, and, you know, there, you know, something, you know, there's, 
you know, white wines I would drink between a year to two to five years old, red wines from, you know, lighter, fruitier ones from two to five years old up to like the La Castellana or Cabernet Sauvignon. I like them personally at 20 or 25 years old, but that's an acquired taste that you have to establish wine cellar and la have the wines last in your cellar that long without drinking them. So, uh, Again, you come out, if any of you guys want to come out here and want to taste old wine, either from your birth year or something close to your birth year, we have enough wines out here that I'd be more than glad to pop a bottle and show how they age, age uh, gracefully. There's a, another axiom that there's, uh, you know, you know, uh, nothing worse than fl faded flowers, but uh, uh, I forget how it goes over there. I'll, it'll come to me in a second, but, you know, uh, Nothing worse than faded flowers, but you know, don't serve any wine before it's time. You know, it's, it, wines do age gracefully, also, but you don't want to serve them too old because you lose some of those root flavors. Any other questions? Any other comments on the wines? Uh, oh, what about bag? Oh, what about bag in the box wines? That's another good question. That's a popular style that has come up over the past oh five or ten years, and I think that the. the uh, most of the wine you see in bag of the box is just everyday drinking wine. And what's happening there is because as you tap the, 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 the bag as such, you're not letting any air in there. So you're always going to keep it fresh and bright and fruity. So bag of the box wines will hold up quite comfortably. You get a three liter box or even you know, a three liter box is the equivalent of four bottles, uh, like black box and some of the other uh, box wines out there. Just light, easy, fruity, easy to deal with. Um, and recycle the packaging. So uh, the, the wines can be solid. They won't age like a red wine will or white wine that's cork finished, but they're, to, they're not really meant to be aged. They're meant for current consumption. Yeah, Boda Box. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very, very popular wine out there. That's for sure. Uh, and it, and, it's, and it, 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 it's nice, easy drinking. It's easy to bring with you on a boat or you know, out camping. You don't have to deal with glass. Uh, yeah, so it's, a, it's another aspect to look at considering such. So Any feel, other questions? Yeah, I would say feel free now. We're kind of at that point where we can open things up a little bit, make it feel a little bit more like we're in the same room. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to un, unmute yourselves yeah, and, everybody uh, and, and ask a question. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really a um, we're, we're, we're really enjoying these. I mean, my husband, and I, I mean, I like, I like the rosé really well. I, I love a rosé of Pinot Noir, which is why I asked that question, because our local um, Westport River Vineyard makes a oh, nice yeah. rosé of Pinot Noir. Yeah, but, I've, I've, um, been, I've, been to, I've been to Westport Winery. They yeah. make some lovely, I love their sparkling wines it's, out there also. They make some nice champagne. Was, yeah, yeah, and yeah, do, the sparklings are good. This we also make a sparkling wine too. We do make a wine called uh, Spumante, you know, like uh, Asti Spumante. Asti is the town. Spumante just means sparkling, you know, wine as such. And we make a Spumante, uh, Brut style, dry style. Then we make a Spumante Rosé, which is a Pinot Noir based uh, sparkling wine also, which is pretty lovely. But uh, yeah, so I love Westport wines. They, they, they do a great job out on the coast there in uh, Massachusetts. I guess this will just give me a quick moment to make a little plug for our very first in-person event, although we had an in-person event last night sort of by accident, um, as we uh, as we mixed drinks with Dieter Cam, some of us were at the local um, Thirsty Beaver mixing drinks there, and so it nice. was uh, it was pretty interesting, but, um, but we um, have an event on June 5th at Newport Polo, and we'll be serving, um, we'll be serving Prosecco there, we always do, um, yep, copious yeah. bottles, uh, I don't know quite how many we're going to order, but my husband once opened what 55? 55. 55 bottles. <laughs> um, we don't have nice. any tickets this year. So and now we get a tip certified mm -hmm. server, but but um it, it's great. Does anybody else have any questions? Feel free. Noreen, are you gonna un yeah, unmute? This was great. Thank you. I loved it. Thanks. It's interesting, you know, I am going back and just pouring a little bit of the San Giovese and pouring it side by side. I put the Sangiovese side by side with the uh, La Castellana that we're not tasting tonight, but I have with me here. And the fact that it has some Sangiovese in it, but it's more of a Cabernet-based wine. This is a much fuller bodied wine. The La Castellana, uh, it would have been fun to taste, but I think it really needs some time. And that's a 2014 vintage where on the, on the uh, Sangiovese, we're tasting the 2016 vintage. This is a pretty, the La Castellana is very full bodied, rich, unctuous, lots of side of beef. It's screaming for a steak, you know, or uh, elk, 
something like that would be perfect with this wine. Where they, I find there's a little more elegance to the Sangiovese. That's why I go with pasta dishes with tomato sauces with the Sangiovese, where the La Castellana would be fuller body and go uh, with more beef dishes and, uh, you know, fuller body, you know, cuisine. Well, that one's out of our price range, but we did buy a case. Right, that's of the, it. We bought a case of the, what you can pronounce it because it's in German. Gewürztraminer. Oh, oh, yeah. The Gewürztraminer, yes. <laughs> Which is one, yeah, it's a dry, we make a dry Gewürztraminer, we make a slightly sweet one, and we make a dessert style. And Robin, you got the dry Gewürztraminer, which is my favorite style. Those, those grapes come from Anderson Valley, Mendocino. We have vineyards up in Mendocino, which is about 100 miles to the northwest of us out along the coast. And it's a little bit cooler growing area. You see Riesling, Gewürztraminer, and Pinot Noir being the prime grapes out in that area. Rather, than, we don't want to grow Gewürztraminer here in Napa Valley. There's very, very little. There's a few. Stoning Hill Winery is one of my favorites. But um, uh, if you see very, very little bit of Gewürztraminer grown in Napa Valley because it's a little bit too warm here to grow uh, Gewürz. There's better, better grow Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel and, and uh, Chardonnay and uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Bill, I think you mentioned this, and I think I might have been, you know, getting up to get something from my charcuterie board or something. But um, so does the castle not, do they grow some of their own wine? Yes, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, we grow about 40% of our own fruit is a rough estimate. We have, say, Cabernet Sauvignon right up near the winery. And then we have uh, about a 200 acre vineyard of the Cabernet. We have about 30 acres of Cabernet up near the, right around the winery. And uh, we have a little bit of Sangiovese up there. Uh, some Malbec and Petit Verdot. And then we have a 200 acre vineyard of Pinot Noir in the Carneros region. The Carneros being the southernmost part of Napa and Sonoma. And that's where I live. I'm, I'm down in the Carneros right now. And that area, because you're so much closer to the San Francisco Bay, it's ideal for going Chardonnay and Pinot Noir because you get the fog influence in the morning, keeps it a little bit cooler. And the wind in the afternoon kicks up. That's why my hair is kind of flying all over the place. And it, it, it uh, so it's, it's probably five to 10 degrees cooler here at my house down south of Napa Valley than it is 30 miles north in Calistoga. That's why you get these little different microclimates within Napa Valley or Sonoma County is the same way and Mendocino. Yeah. Uh, most wine growing areas have these little pockets of microclimates that will uh, you know, prove conditions better for different varietals. Oh, that's great. You know, while, while we've got everybody here still, um, we actually have an alum who um, with the partner has started um, making wine called Drive Winery. Drive, right? Do I have the name right, Jess? Or Kathleen, you know. I, yeah, we, it's we Drive, yeah. Drive, it was, we ordered some from him. It was a lot of fun. It was very good. Um, we'll share the information because we really want to plug our own alumni who are, you know, in this sort of in this business. Um, I know a couple of years ago, we had an event in, at a Connecticut winery um, and so, you know, we're always looking for connections in this area. It's, it's really kind of fun. Jess, were we going to share the wine wheel or did we decide not to do that? Yeah, you can, you, I, I, I don't know if people are familiar with the wine wheel. You're welcome to show it on the screen if you like, and I could talk about it. Yes, let me just bring it up, right? Yeah, I was just, I was interested because you were, we've seen it at one other, if, if anybody attended one of Vinpina's, we've, we've used it before, but you were involved in developing it a little bit. So, right, right. Ahead, tell us about it. Sure. Well, this is uh, this image here, this colorful wheel shows different flavor components. And uh, this was developed by Dr. Ann Noble, who's a bit, uh, enology professor at UC Davis back in the early 80s. And her grad student, uh, graduate student, uh, getting her master's degree, uh, Pat Howe. Pat went on to work at Domaine Chandon Winery. Uh, and, uh, but back in the early 80s, they were coming up with fla how flavors relate to each other as such. And I was, I was a student at the time, 1981 and 1982, when I went to Davis, just happened to be the time that this project was being developed. And one of the classes that we had in enology was called sensory analysis. How do you put into words what you're tasting? Uh, flavor components because people say oh that tastes like cherry well do you throw cherries in those wines no we don't throw cherries in them that's just the esters the chemical components uh the that coming out of the wine and the flavor wheel shows all these different um 
different flavors around the wheel is such that uh, how they relate to each other and the way they're positioned on the wheel is statistical correlations. We took, you, everybody took statistics classes at Bryant for the most part. And uh, this is what you, you take that information and see how flavors relate to each other. And that's how the positioning is lines up on the wheel as such. So it's kind of a it's kind of a cool piece. It's a it's a it's just a tool, just to give you an idea of what flavors. So you use that, and uh, you, know, you have one in front of you, and say, does it taste like strawberries? Does it taste like cherries? Uh, you know, just kind of see how it works out, and then what the root of those flavors are. If you take honey, butterscotch, diacetyl, or butter, those all, all can be kind of considered caramel-like flavors. Uh, the yellow, the yellow portion there, and then different ones for the purples, for the fruits and blues, and such. It's a, uh, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool tool, and such, just to show how flavors relate to each other. But it really boils down to statistically correlations. So you look at the, you know, on the purple side versus the green side. So you have, uh, you know, the, I put my glasses on so I can read this thing a little, a little closer. I can't see that. But yeah, so uh, fruit is diametrically opposed from the earthy kind of tones as such. So it just gives you an idea how flavors relate to each other. Anything else? Super. Any other questions? Jim, do you, you just unmuted. Yeah, we have a question. So I love Italian reds, but I'm not a fan of oaky wines. Right. So, so your Castellana. La Castellana, yeah. yeah. Would you consider, is that a very oaky wine? It's or? Moder moderately oaky. How, did, did you have a chance, were you tasting the, the regular Sangiovese? Do you, yes. Did, yeah, I, is that, you like that? I like that? that a lot. And what I find is like the first sip always to me tastes very oaky. And then after you have maybe something to eat or a couple more sips, then it's smooth and I really like it. But overall, if that first sip of a wine is very oaky, I'm not a fan, but I think something like this probably would be very smooth and... Yes, the Sangiovese here is kind of in the mid-range. I think you look at Pinot Noir, it's gonna be a little bit lighter and less uh, less of that oak character. It cuts into oak, but you don't want, because the fruit is so delicate, you don't want to leave it into oak too long, uh, maybe you know, up to a year or so, where the La Castellana, that was in barrel for probably two years. Right. The Sangiovese here was a year and a half, but it was uh, when barrels are first, you know, put together and, and put wine in for the first time, they'll, they'll pick up a lot of oak character, where if the, as, the, as time goes on and you use it the second or third year, that oak character has been leached out and the wood being porous allows the wine to mature gracefully within the barrel and get a little oxidation going on, kind of like a cork would when it's in the bottle. Um, so Pinot Noir and Sangiovese, um, Dolcetto is another Italian variety that's very light, fresh and fruity. Gamay, which is a grape used for making Beaujolais in France. Uh, it doesn't have any oak usually at all. Uh, and there'll be light, fresh, easy drinking style. So I, I would stick with those style wines where Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, some of the big, bold Zinfandels and uh, especially Petite Syrah can be uh, very, very tannic. Mm -hmm. uh, wines and they need some time to age. They're Cabernet Sauvignons, in my opinion. I mean, they're, they're nice. They're, they're tasty when they're five years old, but patience is a virtue. I mean, mm -hmm. those things will age very gracefully for 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, depending on cellaring conditions. Okay. Excellent. Well, we're ready for a trip. So let's do it. We'll, we'll see you. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to show you guys around. Thank you. This was excellent. I have so, other questions. Sure. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like the differences in glasses? So when like I'm buying a wine glass, there's ones for like reds, whites. Right. Small, like uh, great, great what? question. Great question. There's a, there's a company called Ridal, R-E-I-D-E-L, that, that specializes in making different style glasses for different wines and such. And in general, uh, you know, white wine, the, the glass that I was using here is just kind of all around purpose. You want to have it uh, convex so it, you know, it's, you know, it's a little narrow at the top than at the, the widest point. And that, the reason for that is it allows the aromas to really be concentrated when you're, when you're smelling the wines and such. White wine glasses tend to be a little bit smaller, maybe a 
four to six ounce glass like this. Red wines, because of the uh, fuller bodied red wines, because of the tannins, you want to have a, a bigger glass so you have more surface area. You don't want to fill it. The widest you want to fill a wine glass is right to the widest point. You don't want to fill it too full because then you won't get the aromas out and you'll slosh it over the edge of the glass. Uh, you don't want to have it too too you know, shallow because you're just going to be filling it again. But the wine glass, ideally, you want to fill a wine glass right to the widest point. That's the that's the best spot to fill a wine glass. So um, sparkling uh, flute shaped glasses allow the bubbles to come nicely. Uh, white wine glass, medium range like this for white wines, and then red wines, a fuller bigger glass and then for dessert wines because your dessert wines are so sweet you only really need a small glass maybe a two ounce or three ounce glass again you want to have that convex kind of uh shape to it so you can get some aromas coming out directly but uh you don't need big glasses for dessert wines such as ports or sherries or late harvest uh german wines uh trunken beer and auschlesen uh ice vines things like that you're, you're only going to serve two ounces at a time because they're just so concentrated in fruit flavors so uh yeah there's uh but look at ridal as a company, if you're looking to get a different set of glasses, we have one set of it. They have a Pinot Noir glass that I love. It's a big bowl shape that uh, that really it's it's wide at the base, so it allows a lot of air to get into the wine, but it's fairly narrow up at the top, and it really concentrates the aromas because Pinot Noir is so delicate. Uh, a glass of that shape really is uh, quite valuable as such. But in general, a, a glass like I'm using today is an all-around good-purpose glass. My the other end of the coin is as long as it doesn't leak, you know, it doesn't dribble out on you. It's it's, it's fine. Just paper cups, whatever, it all works. <laughs> well, that's Phil. As somebody just asked about a stemless wine glass. Um, actually, Leanna asked about it. Thanks, yeah. Leanna. Leanna's yeah. ready to go to Napa with us too. So. Excellent. Come on, Leanna. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, yeah, a bowl, you know, uh, stemless wine glasses is fairly a fairly new concept here in the U.S. And we don't. Oh, Oops, we lost it. we kind of lost you for a second. I think you muted. Am I back? Am yes, I, can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> okay, sorry, I don't know how that happened. Um, my bad. Uh, so, yeah, stemless wine glasses. I mean, over in Europe, you see people serving, you know, every day, Van Ordinaire, Van de Tabla, uh, in, in, in stemless glasses. It's just a tumbler. It's a beverage. It's not a big, you know, uh, you know ceremonial event as such. And that's why you're starting to see stemless wine glasses become popular again. But I think holding a stem, stemless glass, you're gonna get fingerprints on it. That's why if it's a really special wine, I still like to use a stemmed wine glass, but I have no problem using stemless wineware for just everyday drinking as such. Anything else? If I, yeah, the read all glasses, they're, they, they're good, but they are, they tend to be expensive. That's true. Yeah. But they, you want to uh, spell that? R E, uh, it's R E I D E L or I R I E D E L. It's one of the two. I think read R I D D E L, right out. Yeah. And that's a company that's uh, out of Germany. George White Rybell, right, 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 uh, started this company 20, probably 30, 40 years ago at this point. And uh, it's a, it's a, I, I like their stemware. They have various levels depending on delicacy of the glass. They have some very delicate ones that are thin crystal that are, you know, $100 a glass. You don't need to spend $100 a glass. I don't they're, think so. They're pretty, but I'd rather spend $100 on wine than on the glass itself. Or a trip to Napa. Or a right, trip to Napa. Right, that's, right. that's for sure. Yeah. Bill, so, I think we're, I, I think we're, I think we're, I think we've come full circle here. Yep. Um, so um, we wanted to put up your contact information one more time. Um, yeah, take, yeah, there you this, go. This yeah, my uh, my yeah. Uh, e contact me via email, the lowercase o, then the word nine, followed by castellodamorosa.com. Uh, my number is 707-403-7042. Uh, that's my work number. Uh, I didn't print up my my cell number. Anybody have called my cell phone? I don't care. My cell number is 707-815-8575. But uh, I'll always answer either one. I'm available 23-7. I take one hour off a day. That's just kind of a thing that I just try to take one hour off a day one way or the other, get a nap or something like that. So 
<laughs> but it's, a, it's been an honor and a pleasure to share the wines with you today. Thank you so much, one and all, for joining in. Hopefully you enjoyed. Feel free to give me a call anytime. Send me an email, any comments, criticisms, whatever, how I can be uh, a better service for you guys. I'm here to uh, enjoy wearing my Napa golf shirt. You want to come out and play golf? we got a really cool Muni golf course out here and a couple of private clubs and things like that. Bill, do you golf. play Napa Country Club? I have played Napa Country Club. I'm not a Thank member you. over there, but I have friends that are members there, so I have played it, yes. I love and playing so, golf and short in uh, Napa. It's great. And then Silverado Country Club, where they yes, have the yes. PGA tournament, and then uh, Eagle Vines Golf Course, and then Chardonnay Golf Chardonnay. Course. Those are all within 10 minutes, 15 minutes of my house. Yeah, great places. So. Yeah, so come on. Let's go out and play some golf, and uh, we'll, we'll stash a bottle of wine in the bag, and uh, we'll see how the handicap ends up. You're on. We hope Hey, Doreen, I hope you don't mind that you've, you've, he's just invited like 30 people to your house. <laughs> well, we'll it's, come in. This is we'll, nothing new. <laughs> yeah. She's seen we'll that. She's seen My that before. My room is all. the guest room. Yeah. yeah. Right. Lizzie's okay. room is the right. guest room. All right. right. Thanks, you know. Liz. <laughs> Lizzie's Liz. room is the guest room, so it's not uncommon. I'll say, hey, we got somebody who's coming for dinner. Well, they just stay the night, you know, so we're, 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 we like to entertain. We like to enjoy. We love to cook. Doreen's yeah. a great cook, great chef, uh, accountant by trade. She's a CPA, retired CPA, and I know Bryant was a major in accounting right, program, but she got her degree at University of Connecticut over in stores, but a uh, <laughs> long, long time ago, and she's a retired accountant now, so she's yeah. having fun uh, cooking and uh and uh, hanging out with our granddaughter, Harmony. So we have a two-year-old. She's going to be two years old on Monday. So uh, we're having yeah. a good time with, uh, with the baby well, out here. Phil, it was great to meet. It was great to, great to meet Liz, Eliza. And, uh, you know, you're just in Boston. So you'll have to come to some of our alumni events. We'll, uh, I'd love we'll to. Make sure we make sure. And, uh, Bill, you've got a reunion coming up in 2023. So I'll make a point. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we do an in-person person wine tasting. Yeah, event, yeah. Um, Let's do it. For, for your reunion. Um, yep. But in the meantime, this is the next best thing. And I, I think it's worked really well. It's great. Um, we all got, whether you got the wines or not, you have a feel for it. Um, and Bill has been great to us. I mean, that $9.95 shipping for a Yeah, $9.95 for a case um, of shipping cross country. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah, I can do that regularly. <laughs> and, oca and occasionally we have free shipping, but that's, uh, then it affects the price of the wine a little bit. But the $9.95 shipping, I can pretty much do on cases across the country anytime. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And it'll, it'll arrive in five to seven. You know, it's FedEx ground. It'll arrive in five to seven days. And uh, I make a point of following the tracking numbers so everybody knows when the wine's going to show up. So it's uh, it's a, it's a it's an easy way to easy way to do it. So I'm more than glad to help you out. Anybody who wants to buy any of our wines? Again, the wines are only sold at the Castle. So if anybody wants to buy some of our wines, you know, feel free to e reach out via email or cell phone and. Uh, uh, any comments or criticisms, how I could do this better, I'm more than glad to, I'm always learning from this thing too. So it's another Bryant learning experience. Yeah, well, it's a, we have a great network and we love it. We love to be together. So thank you very much. 